Hi, and welcome everyone. I think we'll, uh, it's already two minutes past three, so we will start the webinar now. And I welcome you to the this ChemSec webinar where we will discuss uh, flora polymer so, uh, insights from the OECD. We will have some science updates and uh, we'll also talk about safer alternatives. Um, I will uh, can just start with saying that um, the recording of the webinar uh, and the slides from the webinar will be made available afterwards to everyone who has registered to this webinar. Um, I will start with giving a very brief background to ChemSec and our work and also the, the aim we have with this webinar. Um, so ChemSec is a Swedish NGO. Um, we drive the political discussion on hazardous chemicals. Uh, we try to challenge companies to improve their chemicals management. And in order to do that, uh, we have uh, developed a set of online tools to help companies in the change to safer chemicals. Uh, and apart from that, we also try to inv inform investors about the risks and opportunities in the chemical industry. Um, so what we want to achieve uh, is a planet beyond chemical pollution. Uh, the tools that I mentioned uh, connect, uh, are around uh, the substitution of uh, hazardous chemicals. So we have the sin list, which is our list of chemicals that think we think should be banned. We have the PFAS guide which is a way for companies to understand their use of PFAS, uh, in a, which products and processes they might have PFAS. We have ChemSec Marketplace, where companies can advertise safer alternatives to hazardous chemicals. We have ChemScore uh, and Sin Producers, uh, which uh, deals with the, the chemical company and the producers of uh, the chemicals. Um, today, we will talk about uh, fluoropolymers and, and PFAS. Therefore, uh, we also want I also want to mention uh, the PFAS movement, which is a set of companies that want to move away from PFAS, uh, that agree that PFAS is an environmental and human health issue, uh, and that they all want to move away and phase out these chemicals. I also want to mention the IIHC, which is uh, the Investor Initiative on Hazardous Chemicals, uh, which is supported by ChemSec. Uh, it consists today of over 60 investors managing over $13 trillion in assets under management or assets under advice. Uh, and one of the most important key asks that these investors have is to phase out uh, forever chemicals or persistent chemicals. Uh, so it's not, there is a range of different stakeholders that want companies and authorities to act on PFAS. Um, but today uh, we will talk about more specifically about fluoropolymers. Uh, so I will give a very brief introduction to the to the subject, even though I I believe that most of you uh, know. I just want to share uh, the, an introduction. Uh, so fluoropolymers are basically fluorinated plastics, uh, and these plastics provide a range of functionalities to products and processes. Uh, the fluoropolymers are extensively used in many different applications. Uh, they are used in consumer products uh, like frying pans, outdoor clothing packaging, electronics, uh, and furniture, for example. Uh, but it's also used in industrial applications, for example, in pipes, as lubrication and gaskets, O-rings and sealants. Uh, around 50,000 tons of fluoropolymers are produced in EU, uh, according to Plastic Europe, and the industry sees a strong growth of uh, the demand for fluoropolymers. Uh, in the context of fluoropolymers, there has been a lot of, uh, several claims uh, regarding fluoropolymers, uh, including that they are significantly different from other PFAS, and also that they are polymers of low concern under the so-called OECD criteria. Um, when it comes to uh, fluoropolymers and the upcoming PFAS, universal PFAS restriction, um, the, that restriction has used the OECD definition of PFAS, which includes fluoropolymers. And since uh, this definition includes um, fluoropolymers, they are in scope for the universal PFAS restriction. It is also important to point out that uh, fluoropolymers are a major source of PFAS emissions during their life cycles, life cycle. Um, and due to this, uh, they are under regulatory scrutiny uh, since they are included in the PFAS family. Um, so that was the, the brief introduction. Uh, the focus of this webinar will uh, uh, focus on three different things. So we will look at the, have a uh, presentation regarding the OECD work on polymers and on fluoropolymers, that should be, and on PFAS. Uh, we will also look at the, the scientific perspectives on, on fluoropolymers. 
And lastly, which I would say it's also very, very important, is that we need to understand what are the safe alternatives? How can we identify? How can we develop them? So we will look at how we can approach the challenge of replacing polypolymers from a properties uh, perspective. Um, but to do this, we also we have a set of um, very, I would say, impressive speakers. So I'm very happy uh, to have uh, Eva Leinala from uh, OECD, uh, Juliana Glüge from ETH, Sirish, uh, and Emil Damgård Möller uh, from DTI, the Danish Technology Institute, um, who will give their presentations on the different subjects. Uh, we have a Q&A function, uh, so if you have different questions, uh, please post them in the Q&A and we will take them in the end of the uh, webinar after the presentations. And again, I would just like to repeat that a recording of the webinar, as well as the slides, will be distributed to the registrants of the webinar after the webinar. Uh, and with that, I will be happy to hand over to Eva. Uh, so yeah, Dr. Eva Leidala. Is, has a PhD in biochemistry, and today she works at OCD, where she is the principal administrator of risk reduction of GLP, of mutual acceptance data, uh, and chemical accidents. Uh, so please, Eva. Great. Thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction and for the invitation to, to be take part in this webinar today. So in my presentation, I will um, give you some highlights of the OECD work on PFAS. Uh, and also um, provide you with some of the, the history and clarifications of, of what work has uh, taken place on polymers uh, at the OECD. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So uh, just uh, briefly on PFAS. Uh, so the OECD has been working on uh, PFAS and various issues related to PFAS for about 20 years. Uh, we held a global forum in February uh, of this year and for that uh, global forum, we put together a very short document that points to the various work products of the OECD on PFAS. Uh, so if you want to have a better overview um, of the work that we've done on PFAS, you can go to this um, uh, global forum uh, website and, and have a look at that document. Uh, but since uh, 2012, uh, the, the work really has focused on uh, facil facilitating exchange of information amongst regulators and stakeholders uh, on PFAS and, and to also support a global transition towards safer alternatives. And all of the uh, outputs of, of the work uh, are available on the OECD PFAS portal. And next slide, please. So um, as, as we'll be talking more about alternatives uh, as well today, I just wanted to highlight some of the work on alternatives that the OECD uh, has done on PFAS. So we have focused um, on different uh, sectors or types of uses uh, of PFAS um, to look at uh, what PFAS are being used uh, in those particular sectors and applications, what alternatives are available, uh, information on the technical um, performance of those uh, alternatives, um, also um, some of the costs associated with moving uh, to those alternatives, and then trying to understand uh, how alternatives have been uptaken uh, or not in different uh, sectors and uses. So we've looked at food packaging, uh, coatings, paints and varnishes uh, and cosmetics uh, just recently published in, in February. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to look across these uh, different reports because the situation of PFAS uses and alternatives is quite different uh, depending on the particular sector. Uh, the one most linked uh, with fluoropolymers, I would say, is the, the report on coatings, paints, and varnishes. Uh, this report covers an array of different types of uses, from things like uh, wire coatings to um, solar panel coatings to um, architectural paints um, and other types of coatings, paints, and varnishes. And the, the report highlights that um, actually there are alternatives available for, for many of the uses, and for the most part, alternatives are being used, especially, except for where special and specific technical functionality uh, is needed. And that's where uh, you tend to see the continuation of the fluoropolymer uh, uses. And one of the drivers of this is, is the cost that often the alternatives uh, in this particular um, uh, sector are uh, more expensive, uh, are cheaper uh, than the continue, continued use of PFAS. And so uh, the PFAS are only used um, when that technical functionality is needed. 
uh, but I encourage you to take a look uh, across those uh, reports. Uh, next slide, please. So another uh, project that we had uh, earlier, uh, a few years ago, we uh, looked at the terminology uh, that had been being used for PFAS because there was different um, uh, different terminology being used in, in different countries and amongst different stakeholders. And, and although there had been some very good definitions uh, of PFAS, uh, there, there was a, uh, there was more knowledge uh, now to um, revise uh, the PFAS definition. So in 2022, we published a revised PFAS definition. It's a very much a structure-based uh, definition uh, to capture comprehensively the universe of, of PFAS. Uh, one of the main uh, points of the document is to better communicate uh, how. Um, uh, the scope of the, the PFAS uh, being described in a particular regulatory activity or a particular assessment or a particular report, uh, but it also goes through um, ways that uh, you could um, subcategorize PFAS based on their molecular structural traits um, and highlights how um, there, while this is a comprehensive definition, you could have other ways of scoping your work on risk assessment or risk management of, of PFAS, uh, depending uh, on your needs. And one of the main sort of uh, categorizations of PFAS is, of course, uh, polymeric and non-polymeric PFAS. So if you can go to the next slide, please. And what we heard uh, from regulators and stakeholders is that um, they wanted more information to understand uh, polymeric PFAS and their life cycle. So a lot of the work uh, on PFAS, uh, especially the regulatory aspects, have been on non-polymeric PFAS, so PFOA, uh, PFOS, uh, um, and other um, uh, non-polymeric PFAS. And uh, there hasn't been much, as much attention uh, focused on the polymeric PFAS. So we've been uh, uh, developing a series of reports on polymeric PFAS. We published uh, in last year, the report on sidechain fluoridated polymers. We're just finalizing a, a report on perfluoropolyethers. And uh, over this year, we'll be developing a report on fluoropolymers. And, and these reports, they don't, um, they're not focused on uh, hazard aspects, but really uh, looking at um, basic things like substance identity, what are different types of substances that fall uh, into these um, subgroups of polymeric PFAS, uh, what do what do we know about? I guess their their identity, uh, uh, information on their production, um, uh, some of their uses, what's available in the public domain on uh, things like production volume, uh, potential releases to the environment, um, etc. So trying to synthesize uh, some of this information uh, for others to to use in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So for my next uh, few slides, I'm going to uh, provide uh, you with some history on the work of uh, OECD on polymers uh, and what uh, what has been what has been done in the past. So this um, a bulk of this work actually started in the early 1990s, um, where when at that time OECD had a polymer expert group. And one of the first uh, things that was done in that group too was to agree on a definition of polymer. Uh, and so there is an OECD de definition of polymer that has been taken up um, by many uh, regulatory uh, jurisdictions um, uh, in terms of their uh, activities um, and also uh, defining polymers for their regulations. Uh, also in 1993, the polymer expert group uh, discussed uh, criteria for decision-making rega regarding low concern polymers. So there were several, actually seven uh, main criteria that were discussed at that time, um, although they did uh, discuss uh, some uh, additional criteria, um, but all the particular uh, parameters were not agreed for uh, all of these uh, seven main uh, criteria. Next, next slide, please. So uh, then there wasn't so much work uh, in the meantime on, on polymers until uh, the late 2000s. So in um, 2007, uh, at that time, there was an OECD task force on new chemicals notification assessment. 
uh, and that task force organized an expert group meeting on polymers. So this was very much for countries to talk about how they are addressing polymers in the context of their new chemicals notifications, how they have incorporated that into their national legislative schemes, um, how different countries were using different criteria uh, for uh, regulatory registration, uh, such as using um, uh, criteria for low, uh, low concern polymers, um, and they were discussed different um, different aspects of their, their approaches. So really an information sharing uh, between countries. And uh, from that meeting, it was then decided between 2007 to 2009 uh, to look further at the, at the topic of polymers of low concern and have an analysis of uh, polymer data that, um, uh, that had been submitted to different OECD regulatory uh, authorities. So based on that uh, discussion, they, they looked at what different uh, countries had been using as um, uh, polymers of low concern uh, criteria, but also looked at um, how information that was available supported, um, supported the uh, idea that uh, these polymers, polymers were actually of low concern if they were meeting these uh, criteria. And they found that um, for the most part, there was insignificant human health or environmental impacts of meeting this criteria, but there were also a lot of data gaps um, in terms of the information uh, that was available to be used uh, to, be, uh, to, to make that assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, actually, this is a, a figure from a Grow et al. paper in 2023. So uh, while at the OECD, uh, there, were, there was not uh, harmonization of the uh, polymers of low concern criteria, several countries did implement criteria for reduced regulatory requirements for polymers. Uh, these were, as I said, mostly in the context of their new chemicals notification programs. Um, and it really would depend on the, the nature of their regulatory systems. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of darker line in the in the middle of this table. It's a bit hard to see, but uh, above that were are the, the the main criteria that had been initially discussed at the OECD and how they were integrated in different regular, regulatory schemes. Um, as you can see, there's a diversity of ways that they were uh, that was done. And below the line were then also additional uh, criteria that uh, countries had implemented uh, in their regulatory schemes. So um, I just want to point out that the last column is the European uh, Commission, but actually this is from the, the draft uh, that was um, draft work on uh, potential registration of polymers for REACH that was underway when this paper was published. And in that context, uh, the, the criteria were, be, were um, being applied in a different way as to identify which uh, polymer should be uh, registered and not ones that should be uh, exempt from uh, registration. Um, but if you want to know how those are applied, it's, it's recommended to look at the individual uh, country regulations. Next slide, please. So since 2009, uh, there hasn't been further work carried out at the OECD regarding polymers of low concern. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we have not established an ag agreed set of criteria for polymers of low concern. And right now there's no plan to revisit uh, the criteria. This could change if, if countries highlight this as, uh, as something that they want to work on uh, again in the future together. Next slide, please. So um, linking uh, back to fluoropolymers. So of course, uh, this uh, issue is also being raised now because many countries are setting out their risk management approaches for PFAS, including uh, management of fluoropolymers. Uh, there have been a number of studies. You can consult those in the scientific literature of analysis against uh, polymers of low concern criteria that has been uh, justified, uh, that has been used to justify low concern for polymers. Um, and at the same time, there are concerns that have been raised regarding the life cycle of fluoropolymers, uh, which of course are not addressed um, by using the polymers of low concern uh, criteria. Next slide, please. So yes, I just uh, wanted to give you an overview um, of the OECD PFAS work and what we've done on polymers and I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions uh, later on in the webinar. Look forward to hearing from the other two uh, speakers as well. 
So I think you can just go to my last slide, which gives my contact information. Uh, feel free to contact me as well at the OECD. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, uh, for that uh, summary of the OECD work on PFAS and polymers. Uh, very interesting to hear. Um, so from that, we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Juliane Glüge uh, from ETH in uh, Zürich. Um, uh, Juliana has a PhD in chemistry and she is now the senior researcher at the Hall. And she will uh, give a brief introduction to the, the science uh, on the fluoropolymers and the status of that science. So, uh, please, uh, Juliana. Yep. Thank you very much for the invitation. And as I said, I will talk today about fluoropolymers and also the associated challenges that we see with the science. And uh, just as a small disclaimer, um, the first two slides that I'm showing are actually contents that I took from slides from Ian Cousins. Um, next slide, please. So I would like to start with a brief overview of the PFAS universe. As you just heard, um, there are non-polymeric PFAS and polymeric PFAS. And I think most of you are familiar with the carboxylic acids and the perfluorocane sulfonic acids, like with P4A and PFAS, PFOS. Uh, but there are also the polymers, like the side chain from the polymers, um, the polymeric perfluoropolyethers, and then of course the fluoropolymers. And according to the definition by Bucket Al, the fluoropolymers are made by the copolymerization of olefinic monomers, and at least one of which contains a fluorine bond to one or both of the olefinic carbon atoms. So basically, this means that you have a chlorinated, or you have a a uh, carbon-only backbone, and there's fluorine attached to it, as you can also see in the small graphics there. Next slide, please. Um, so here you can see the main uses of low polymers as of um, 2015. So it is a bit outdated, but you can see still the main industrial sectors where low polymers are very important. And this is transport and also the chemical and power sector. But fluoropolymers are also used in cookware, in electronics, in food and pharma, in textile and architecture, in medical applications, and the renewable energy, and in many other sectors. And this shows that trying to restrict them and trying to find alternatives is quite challenging because there are so many uses in sectors and also quite large use volumes. And so, of course, a huge efforts are needed actually to replace them or to find alternatives. Next slide, please. And so what I hear often in the discussions is that flow polymers are actually chemically inert. They do not bioaccumulate and they display a different toxicological profile or different toxicological properties than certain other flow chemicals in the PFAS family. Basically saying that they are have a very low, uh, very low toxicity. And then this argument is in a way meant to get them out of the PFAS restriction proposal. And I think it might not be wrong what this is in the use phase, but there's a really big but. And this is there are emissions of the flow polymers that are from the uh, manufacturing. And these emissions include other PFAS as well. There are also emissions during the processing of the flow polymers, for example, in the manufacturing of articles. And flow polymers are like other plastics, they are persistent in the environment. So they can form micro and nanoparticles, but they will actually not degrade completely, like they will not mineralize. And also, if they're incinerated at too low temperatures, then you can also have emissions of chlorinated substances. And I will show you a few more um, scientific articles and arguments to support really this big but, because I think it's important to keep in mind that also it might be very difficult to find the turn to the flow polymers. It is also very important because of these actual emissions from the manufacturing and life cycle. Next slide, please. So one of the emissions that we have is from actually obviously processing aids. And this has been recognized uh, long before in the past. And here's an example from uh, Chemors and Dordrecht where, for example, here water gapping and also others have detected that emerging pair and polyphyl Q substances are in the river and drinking water near the floor chemical production plant. Next slide, please. Mm, but there's also evidence 
from Italy of the Valley of Po said fluor acyl acids are in the river basin. This is coming from the production of low polymers. Next slide. Uh, if we go to the S, there's a very similar picture also here, processing aids, in this case, Genex and other PM polyphacyl acid ethers um, have been found in to contaminate the drinking water. And these three publications here are for the Cape Fear River in North Carolina in the US. Uh, next slide. Uh, but there's also uh, publications from Ohio and West Virginia and also from New Jersey in the US, where again, HFBODA, which is in a way Genix, but also PFOA have been found near the flow polymer production facilities. Um, next slide, please. So in a way, in the past, we have really seen that these flow polymer processing aids have been an environmental problem. They have been detected there and they have um, been widespread around the facilities. And now if we look at uh, Europe and situation here, we can see that Akima is already planning to phase out the use of 6.2 FTS for the PVDF production in Pierre Benit by the end of 2024, and they will shift to a flow surfactant free process. Um, apparently, survey, this is like information from last year, but they will phase out um, ADV in Spinetta Marengo by 2023, but they will continue the use of CEC604. You can see both chemicals below until at least 2026. Now, 3M has announced that it will discontinue its PFAS portfolio entirely by 2025. This will also mean that it will close the plant in Gendorf in Germany, because Dun Dunyang is a full subsidiary of 3M. Um, and then there's also Chemours, and they actually want to continue using fluorosurfactants in their Meissen polymerization and they will focus on reducing emissions to a minimum with abatement techniques. And we have seen in the comments that have been submitted by Chemours to the public consultation of the PFAS restriction proposal that uh, Chemours has tested a lot, also fluorosurfactant free processing aids, but they apparently detected that they generate higher byproducts and that at the end, it's not really an improvement. And so, I think this shows also that it's uh, not always easy to get rid of these surfactants and that we have, um, that is still a challenge in a way. Next slide, please. But in addition to the processing aids, um, there are also other flonated um, organic molecules that can be emitted from the production of low polymers. And you can see here from our recent publications the data that have been reported to us, the European Pollution Release and Transfer uh, to the EPRTR, um, this inventory. And here are the six um, low polymer producers from Europe. And although we can see for Camoas and Solvay that in the last years, the flonated gases, the emissions are going down. In 2021, there were still around 150 tons of flonated gases that had been emitted. And also, I mean, Dun Yong here has really a low, a really low reported emissions, but actually they have a very similar production um, portfolio and also a similar production capacity as the other producers. Um, and it might just, we were just wondering as reported emissions are also actually the, the real emissions. And it might also show that there are also different reporting requirements um, between the manufacturers or so chemos, as far as I know, has to report much more, for example, than other of the producers. Next slide. Uh, but overall, what we could get from the emission permits, uh, we could see that um, in the years, this is now for um, 2017 to 2021, there were more than 360 tons of emissions of various Flonated um, um, organic substances, and at least 100 tons of these emissions were also PFAS. So we have byproducts, intermediates, and processing aids. And here, this is around uh, 60 to 70 tons, they are all PFAS. Then we had the flonated gases that I mentioned before, but also there are monomers, um, which have been emitted 
in various other flonid organic substances. And again, this is probably in, still an underestimation as we only um, got a part, like we got the permits, but maybe not everything has been reported. Next slide, please. Um, so this was kind of the manufacturing process, but we can also look at the uh, other life as life cycle aspects. And what we can see in literature is that depending on the combustion temperature, the humidity and the oxygen content, um, that fluorinated end products can also be formed during the combustion of flow polymers. And those products could be tetrafluoroethylene, hexafluoropropane, and secular octafluorobutane, among others. Um, there's been a recent study that showed that there are no measurable PFAS from are produced from the product, the combustion of PTFE. Um, but at least what I heard is that there's not a full mass balance, flowing mass balance is the study. So I think we have also have to look a bit careful into what has been published and what. But just to summarize, um, if the temperatures are too low or if there are different conditions, there could also be um, combustion products be formed that are fluorinated. Next slide. And what I saw uh, found interesting then in 2022, so almost now two years ago, um, the Pentagon issued a ban on the incineration of PFAS laden items. This was with particular emphasis on the aquas film forming forms um, because the incineration had left the communities nearby polluted. So I guess that the maybe the PFAS content in this incineration plants were then just so high that they had um, too much emissions. But in the end, it shows also here that incineration is not always with zero emissions. There can be all the emissions from incineration of PFAS. Next slide, please. And as a summary, I would like to emphasize a few points which are very important for me. So the flow polymers are currently still important for many industrial use sectors. And I think this is something also we as environmental scientists have to acknowledge that um, they are still used in, in big amounts. But on the other hand, I think manufacturing, processing, and also end of life, they generate emissions of fluorinated substances, including other PFAS, and this cannot be neglected. neglected. So this is something that also chemical industry and also users of flow polymer have to be just have to acknowledge this. And in order to deal with the PFAS pollution that we are already facing and also with future emissions, flow polymer need to be addressed under the PFAS restriction proposal that is currently discussed. Um, but it's a bit hard also to find the balance between the necessary and unfounded derogations because the cause for the complete exemption of flow polymers they're not really helpful. And I think what is needed is specific information on where is this really not possible maybe to find alternatives currently and where have alternatives already been um, in use and where is it more easy. So my point of view, we need a bit more serious and honest discussions so that the PFAS restriction, as a PFAS restriction can protect the environment and us humans, but is also still reasonable for the industrial, industrial applications. And I think, um, I think I would like to thank you for listening and can give over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Juliane, for that overview. Um, I will now uh, turn to the next uh, speaker, who is Emil Ramgård Müller uh, from DTI, the Danish Technological Institute. Institute. Uh, so please, Emil. Thank you. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, as, as agreed, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we find alternatives to the fluoropolymers. And I would like to start out with a quote. That is, 80% of all PFASs can be easily replaced by existing technologies or materials. You might wonder, where do I get such a quote from? Um, that from me. Uh, and the source is my experience and gut feel. So the rest of the presentation today will be about why do I have this gut feel and why do I actually believe that this is possible? A little bit about me. 
Uh, I have a PhD in materials chemistry from Aarhus University, and I've been working at the Danish Technological Institute since 2001. Um, my work has primarily been finding uh, recycling opportunities for materials or substituting materials uh, for other alternatives. Some of you might have noticed Vestas uh, a year ago started uh, claiming that they could recycle their wind turbine blades. That's me and a colleague that developed that uh, technology for them. Then I've been focusing a lot about chemical detective work. So uh, a company finding some kind of substance in their production and they want to know what is it and where do it come from. And then lastly, I've been focusing up on PFAS for the past two years. And that has mainly been mapping out where is the PFAS and finding alternatives within the textile industry, the medical device industry, and for generally fluoropolymers. For those of you who do not know the Danish Technological Institute, you might be familiar with some of the names that are on the screen here. Uh, so we are part of the European RTO uh, research network. We are a little more commercial than most of these companies that you see here and, and focus a little more about direct implementations to, to companies. I will spare you for all of the, the company slides, but it's just to give you an idea of uh, who we are and how we work. I've also in included a quote from a little more uh, reliable source. That's from Jeff Morris from the US EPA. And he said this uh, on the OECD Environmental Forum on, on PFAS here in, in February. The key aspect missing from the equation at the moment is humility, recognizing that not one single action is needed, but rather a suite of actions targeted and prioritized to where it will have the most impact in terms of environmental and health protection is the key to success. I think Jeff is uh, singling me, me out here because I'm not very humble uh, in my approach to PFAS. So let me make something completely clear. I'm a consultant and I have nothing at stake. And it's really easy for me to claim that 80% of all PFAS can be easily replaced when you have nothing at stake. So before we continue with the rest of the presentation, presentation, I just want to acknowledge that the, the task that you are facing, if you are trying to replace fluoropolymers or find alternatives, it's extremely challenging and not something that is just easily done. But again, from my experience and from the work that I've done the past two years, I'm still to see an application where we cannot find an alternative for the fluoropolymers. So, I hope that for the rest of the presentation, it will be a very general overview of the alternatives and there's still a lot of work from here. Let's dive into it. Uh, thank you, Juliana, for a presentation on the PFAS. I actually kind of have, have the same slide here, so I'll go maybe a little more quickly uh, over it. But to me, there's three categories of uh, PFASs. There's the soluble PFASs, that is the, the PFAS used as surfactants or as impregnation for textiles and, and others. And we know that these substances are toxic and the pollution arise from the use phase, like we wash our clothes uh, and it goes down into the drain. Then we have another category that is the, the PFAS gases. We don't really know the toxicity of these yet, but we do know that they are highly potent green, greenhouse gases. And then in the end, we have the polymers, which is the main topic for today. As far as we know, they are not toxic in the use phase, like Teflon on your frying pan at home. You should not be concerned about using that. However, we see that there's a high PFAS pollution from the production of these fluoropolymers and also for the end of life. If you should take one single thing home with you today from my speak, it would be that products are often over-engineered. And this is kind of the essence of finding alternatives to, to the fluoropolymers. Let me just start out by saying that there is very little literature about what 
good alternatives actually exist for fluoropolymers like Teflon or for PVDF or FKM and, and so forth. There is, however, a little uh, literature and sometimes it very, it's very difficult to find. So at the end of my presentation, which will be shared, uh, I've given some, some resources that, that I use every day. But getting back to the over-engineering, if we take Teflon or PTFE, uh, as it's also called, a, as a reference, it has so many different uh, application areas and it can do so many things simultaneously. So if we take, for an example, mechanical properties or resistance to chemicals or resistance to high temperatures, and there's also other areas that I've not in included here, uh, like low friction, if we if we are using PTFE in an application where all of these properties are needed at the same time, we are most likely not going to be able to find an alternative. And we are not going to find a one fit all solution that can completely replace, let's say, PTFE. But what we can do is that if there's some of the uh, properties that we don't need, there's a lot of good possible alternatives. Let's say that we don't need the mechanical properties, but we need the chemical resistance and the high temperature resistance. We have these materials that I've written up here. If we don't need the chemical resistance, but need the mechanical properties and the high temperature resistance, we have these uh, possible solutions. And if we don't need the high temperature resistance, but we need the chemical resistance and the mechanical properties, we have most of you probably know polypropylene, which is the, the plastic used for your average uh, chemicals, uh, chemical bottles. So let me get a little deeper into to the cases, like what, what work have we actually done to uh, substitute some of the, the fluoropolymers? And I just wanted to start out with, with, with a little uh, a story about a company that is uh, trying to develop a new coating for frying pans, actually. The problem is, if you are developing a new PFAS-free coating, then you need some results that you can rely on, like how good is the nonstick function of this, uh, this coating, actually. And the problem is that right now, uh, when you are assessing nonstick functionals in, in, in coatings, you have a very good chef that cracks uh, an egg onto the pan, waits for two minutes, then he takes a spatula and flips it over. And then he says, hmm, that was probably a three out of five in nonstick properties. And that's not reliable data. So we have actually made this device that you see on the screen here, which is an adhesive force apparatus, or as we also call it, the pancake tensile tester, uh, which basically, can give you an accurate uh, measure of how the nonstick properties are of this coating. And when you have good data, you can good, do good development. I really want you to go home with, the, with some, uh, some things today. So I have col collected uh, some cases into two, three different cases that I've brought. The first case, we call them company one. That's a company that has a lot of products and they have basically fluoropolymers in, in most of their products. And it's an enormous task to try to find alternatives to all of these uh, polymers in different applications. So what we did for them was that we made a decision to, to qualify alternative plastic solutions for various applications. So basically they could take a product they could do a quick search of, is there any good alternatives for this application? Yes, no. And then they could see if there, there, there should be an alternative or if they should continue to the next product. So it's kind of a, a fail fast method we developed for them. The next case I want to bring is actually one of my favorite cases because there's a lot of people saying, well, if we exclude PFAS, we are gonna get shit products. And that's not true. We had a company that developed a high-end lubricant with PTFE. And what we actually found out was that the PTFE was doing bad things for the lubricant. So we exchanged the PTFE with another material 
and actually gave that lubrication better low friction properties and longer durability. And lastly, we have helped a, a medical device a company uh, to find alternatives for nonstick uh, coating. And here we found four good solutions, but each of them had some flaws or some things that you had to compromise on if you wanted to implement them. So we basically gave that medical device company a decision foundation to choose which of these alternatives should we, should we go with. This, this uh, decision tool for the fluoropolymers, I would have loved to, to go through it today, but there's not enough time for it. But I have uh, linked in my presentation to a short demonstration of the tool. And please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me if you, you want a, a deeper dive into to this tool. So my main takeaway messages for you today is get started with the substitution process. There are several low hanging fruits because there are so many places where your product is over-engineered. It's so easy to use Teflon PTP because we know it works, but it's not necessary all the time. Secondly, it's from our experience and the companies we've worked with, if you manage to phase out PFAS and you can actually use that in your marketing, you're gonna have a very high competitive advantage and lastly, if we get to the implementation of some of the restriction proposal in, in EU, EU, but also in the US, well, you will have a much easier time to dis uh, of discussing essential use with lawmakers if you can actually prove that you have started substituting your fluoropolymers and other PFASs. And then you can say, well, we tried with these, it's not possible. So, that was my presentation for today. I hope that you get started with uh, replacing your floral polymers. And please, let's keep in touch. You can find me on LinkedIn and my phone number and email is also available in the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emil, for that uh, presentation. Uh, very interesting. I think that focusing on alternatives will be very important for the uh, future. Uh, so. Time for the Q and A. Um, I will start with just a, a brief uh, comment regarding uh, the questions because there has been a lot of questions regarding the restriction. I would like to point out that today uh, the focus of this webinar is not on the on the universal PFAS restriction on and how that will be implemented or not implemented. And none of the speakers here here are sort of connected to the work on on the universal PFAS restriction. Uh, a few things uh, that I would like to answer to uh, if I have time. So TFA, uh, which is a very um, ultra short um, PFAS, is included in the PFAS, uh, within the universal PFAS restriction because it fits the, the OCD definition. Uh, there has been questions regarding testing of PFAS. It is a difficult matter. Uh, it's not something we will be able to cover uh, today. And I think that cover uh, also the, the difference between the EU and the US approach is also something that will be difficult to, to cover today. But I thank you for the, the questions regarding that. And I also can sh say that we have a, uh, had a webinar on the, the PFAS, um, both the PFAS restriction and the consultation reply. So we can, we can set, uh, we can add the, um, those links to the, uh, to the mail you will get with the slides after this webinar. So you can, if you want to freshen up on that, but, uh, we have a few questions that I would like to ask uh, to the panel. And I will start with Juliane because I know you are uh, a bit short on time. Um, but there is one thing that uh, was a question and something that I'm also very interested in is uh, the incineration, which you managed and the problem with what um, other byproducts we get from incinerating uh, PFAS. Um, so have you seen any sort of cost estimations or what is necessary for sort of fitting uh, the incineration facilities to be able to, to incinerate uh, PFAS as well, to make sure that we mineralize the PFAS. No, sorry, I have not seen any cost estimates on PFAS incineration. Um, so one more question for you, Juliane, uh, when we have time. Um, do you think that in the future, it will be possible to limit emissions from polymer production uh, to an acceptable level, uh, apart from banning sort of the, the product, uh, but instead, can we limit uh, the emissions from the production? Um, I mean, it would be nice, of course, <clears throat> if the emissions can further be 
are limited because I think there will be some derogations for flow polymers in the PFAS restriction proposal, and they have to be proposed those flow polymers. So it is an, an also an important step to limit these emissions. And there have been several um, comments made that the industry is already working also on abatement systems to reduce them more. Um, but I'm always wondering, I mean, we have this PFAS problem since so many years now, why the industry arguments come now that they are actually able to limit the emissions because we have already, we see in the rainwater PFAS, we have them in our blood, they are everywhere in the environment. Why has it not ha happened earlier? And there's also no numbers by how much this can be um, reduced, the emissions. And I think even within uh, with European incentives to lower the emissions, there might be even emissions in outside of Europe. So shifting the flow polymer production to outside of Europe might also happen. And then we still have the same problem of emissions from the PFAS production. And that's why I see that limiting, limiting the uses of flow polymers is in a way one of the most important ways forward to reducing emissions because not reducing them also doesn't make like does not make emissions and so thank you. yeah thank you very much for for that clarification um and i know that you will leave soon Juliana. so thank you very much for for your uh contribution um i will take some questions for eva next i think um so uh, will uh, the OECD do any more reports regarding PFAS uses and, and alternatives? Yes, uh, so we plan to uh, do an, an the next report on uh, hydraulic fluids and lubricants. Um, so that will probably be developed over the, the next year. Um, I just, you know, for the cosmetics report, I just wanna say we usually have a follow-up report looking at the um, uh, hazards of the alternatives uh, that were identified in the in those initial reports, and we won't be doing that for the cosmetics report because it was not really drop uh, drop and replacements, but a reformulation uh, of the products. But that's the, that's our plan. Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to the coming reports. So, so one more question for you, Eva. Um, so does OECD plan to update the, the PFAS list uh, with new CAS numbers? Because I know that that's used by many organizations and companies. So do you plan to update that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. We don't have a plan to update it right now, but uh, it's true that we created the list uh, before we updated the definition and the new terminology. Mm -hmm. So um, it is uh, the, the new definition is more encompassing. Um, but we don't have it on our work plan right now, but it's something that we could consider in the in the future. Thank you. I will take one question for, for Emil as well. Um, so, I mean, alternatives is, as you said, it's a, it's a challenging uh, um, thing. Uh, and one of the most challenging thing is regarding the, the costs of alternatives. So do you know, can you please say something briefly about uh, the cost differences between PFAS and, and alternatives? It, it very much depends on what uh, alternative you are looking into. Some of these alternatives would be polypropylene or polyethylene, which are much cheaper than, for example, say, uh, Teflon. Uh, we have also looked into uh, to some solutions that would actually be three or four times more expensive than the current solution. However, in those cases, we have actually seen the lifetime of the product uh, getting prolonged by three to four times. So... Of course, there is going to be some cost associated in, in some cases with the finding an alternative, especially on the R&D or impl implementation side. However, it's something that you're forced to do if the restriction proposal is going through in the way it is now, and they are not considering any cost in, in, as an argument for, for not finding an alternative. So one question more for you, Emil, regarding alternatives, and this is a very, I would say, a very classical question uh, that we at Chemsec have uh, replied to a lot of times. So it might be interesting for to get your version on that one. Uh, but uh, if we want to avoid regrettable substitution, I mean, if we want to make sure that the alternatives that we put on the market is actually safer, how do we do with that in a in a good way? Um, we have several products projects running right now where we are in close collaboration co collaboration with the toxicologists. Uh, basically trying to take it one step ahead instead of just implementing a new solution, actually getting uh, people who know about toxicology 
to look into it. On the other hand, if we are looking at alternatives for specifically the fluoropolymers and we are looking into to plastic replacements, many of these plastics has been around for longer than, than PNTFE and they are not of any concern yet. We are never going to, to, going to be, be able to predict what happens in the future, but what we can say is that we take materials that have been used for, for many decades and they have not proven as uh, toxic they are probably not going to be proven toxic, toxic in the future as well. Good answer. Thank you very much. Um, I also have another for Eva. Um, I mean, OCD is a very uh, trustworthy organization. There is a lot of trust being put in, in OCD doing uh, the work. Uh, so it would be interesting to know. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of knowledge uh, regarding the toxic effects of PFAS. Uh, what, what process within the OCD is needed uh, in order to to change um, the polymer of low concern uh, to polymer of high concern for, for uh, fluoropolymers? So, um, as I mentioned, the, the work on polymers of low concern was, was very much focused on uh, regulatory requirements for registration um, of chemicals. Um, I mean, it could have been called something else at the time. Instead of polymers of low concern, it could have been called, you know, reduce regulatory requirements. But I mean, the driving nature of that was really so that regulators made sure that they examined the, the polymers that could be of higher concern. So yes, you could create uh, criteria of, of high concern somehow. It won't be the flip side of the exact flip side of the polymer of low, low concern, um, but it was a mechanism that... Um, that was being used that uh, to highlight that you know, if if the if the criteria if the if the polymer is different from from these, then we need to take another look at it in terms of having some uh, data submitted in term for regulatory registration. So I mean, and that's still a big part of many um, uh, many chemicals management uh, programs, the new substances notification, um, but also for all, all kinds of um, chemical registrations, there's you know different uh, volume volume levels or or, or things that that drive uh, regulatory registration. So I think that's what really it was created for. Um, so I mean, so I guess the, the, even maybe it's a it's a misnomer in the end, um, but but that's um, that's that that's what that's what the work was uh, done in the 1990s. Um, in terms of you know do, doing something uh, in the future at the OECD on fluoropolymers, as I said, we're developing the the report, uh, looking more at uh, life cycle aspects and identity and uh, production and uses and such. Um, but um, OECD itself is not a regulatory um, body, so we're really trying to provide information um, for countries and other stakeholders to use to better risk manage um, all PFAS chemicals and other chemicals. Thank you. Uh, and now uh, the time is actually four o'clock, so we will uh, close this webinar. I would like to thank uh, the speakers again, Eva Leinola, Emil Damgård Möller and, uh, and Juliane Glüge uh, for very interesting and very insightful uh, presentations. I would also like to end this uh, webinar with a for doing some advertising uh, for the upcoming webinars that we will do at Chemsec uh, at the 11th of April. Uh, we will have another webinar reg more reg focusing on knowledge on alternatives, uh, and we will look at specific uses of, of uh, PFAS. Uh, we will start with a focus on lithium ion batteries, uh, where companies will uh, present production and use of PFAS free solutions. Uh, so please stay tuned in our channels. We will have a link to the newsletter in the which will be sent out uh, with the, the, the slides and the recording. So if you were interested, please uh, listen in. And again, thank you very much for listening today. And thank you to the speakers again. And have a great uh, rest of the Monday. Thank you.